So, let's get started. So, I'm sure the questions oh, I see you already in the back. Yes. You heard the question. The question is when Hannah Arendt said that, that the Jewish leaders were compliant with yeah. the Nazi regime, did she give details as to exactly what they when did? The Hannah Arendt says that the Jewish did leadership did Hannah was Arendt was offer details about what exactly the Jewish leaders the did Nazis. in her book? Did she give more she information she or did, did she justify she that? Did. Um, so, um, okay, can you hear me, everyone? Um, uh, you mean in her book and in the articles, did she actually give details? Um, yes, to a certain extent she gave details, but what's important to remember, as she says in the film, is that, in her view, her reasons for speaking about this uh, were because certain Jewish leaders testified at the trial, and it became clear, as was, I, I should add, well known prior to the trial of Eichmann, that there were Jewish leaders who worked together with Eichmann's office. They provided lists of addresses, they told people to assemble. Uh, there was a sense that some Jewish leaders knew precisely what the destination was for the Jewish people who were assembling um, under Nazi orders, and there was a sense that certain Jewish leaders were not entirely aware of where they were being transported to. But I think the important point is that what there are a couple of facts where she quotes in her book and in her articles many times the work of Raoul Hilberg, for example, who wrote, the, uh, you know, who wrote a book specifically on this subject. So it was not un the, the destruction of the European Jews. And it was not unknown in American or European circles to Jewish people um, that the role of the Jewish leaders and their cooperation or collaboration or their compelled collaboration with the Nazis. That was not unknown. What in my opinion and in the opinion of many caused the, out, the, the fury were, were two very particular points. And one is that everybody knew this in Jewish circles, in Israel, in America, and in Europe. Um, the details were known and published by other people. Um, Hannah Arendt wrote about them in, in the pages of The New Yorker in the early 60s at a time when Jews were not accepted into the academy in the way that they are now. So it was thought that she was airing Jewish dirty laundry in public in America at a very inopportune time and in a very inopportune forum. That was the first point of objection and anger. But a, a second point was not just the facts of the matter. They were almost to the side. It was the way in which she wrote about it. She said that, um, you know, to a Jew, uh, this role of the Jewish leaders in the, you know, in, in, is the darkest chapter of the whole dark story, as we quote in the film. And she felt that had the Jewish leaders not collaborated, um, it would have been, perhaps less people would have been murdered. Not collaborated, cooperated. Thank That's you. That's a big difference. Yes, thank you very much. Um, but she said she said it in this way. It was the way in which she spoke about it that angered people far more than the facts, which were detailed in part by her, detailed in the trial, and detailed in many publications. <clears throat> so I think that's an important distinction. But to comment on this, as we say in the film, she says resistance was impossible. And she says in the film, resistance was impossible. And the great confusion that was made is that she was accused of accusing the Jewish people of co cooperating in their destruction. And she specifically made that difference between the Jewish people, for whom she said resistance was impossible, and the Jewish leaders, where she said perhaps there was a space between resistance and cooperation that some of the leaders might have pursued some of the time. And in the time that she published this, such subtleties as that were not yet acceptable. Did you want to add? No, and what she said, <coughs> it came up 
in the pr uh, in the trial, and since she was like today, I, I I looked up the New Yorker, and it's still the same from the 60s to today. Reporter at large, uh, I, that was for me that was very surprising that they go on really with this tradition, and she was a reporter at large. So she said, I was a reporter, I was not even a philosopher. I reported on it, and I had to report what was coming up in the trial. And in the trial, that was one of the themes, and it came up, and she had to report about it. No? And then, uh, in the end, I think she was a philosopher, and she says, always, oh, it was a fact, and I went, went only as a reporter. But in a certain way, she went there as a philosopher. And what she was writing about and what she was telling in the end, that was really a philosopher speaking and not only a reporter. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think that when, when Bill Sean says, you know, that could count as a kind of interpretation <laughs> when you say it's the darkest chapter in the whole dark story, and she answers, but that's a fact. I think in that dialogue we were trying to communicate the, the idea that she was, yes, she was communicating facts that were well known, and at the same time it's the way in which she spoke about and analyzed those facts that angered people. Yeah, and that to, the, the will to, to say the truth or to confront the truth, uh, that I think was uh, the position of a philosopher. Uh, and not only of a reporter. You have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in the film itself, it seems that you present the view, a view that's very in favor of, of Hannah Arendt. And you, don't, and you present her very much as a philosopher. And the people who are opposed to her are very much presented as highly emotional, not necessarily thinking rigorously in a philosophical way. And I was wondering, when you did research, did you encounter other philosophers, Jewish philosophers, who had approached the same issue in a more philosophical way? Did you consider you know, present how you were presenting him, how you were very positively presenting him, and, and maybe presenting the, her, her opponents at, in, in a different way? OK, did you hear that? Um, I understood you more or less, but uh, um, no, I'm speaking as a director. Uh, and when I'm making a film about a woman or about a person, I go with the person. So making a film about Hannah Arendt, I, can't, I go with her and I take her position. Uh, and, and here we, we even... Oh, what? You just keep it a little further away, I yeah. guess. It's uh -huh. distorting a little. Yeah. No, we, because here we tried also to put in other positions. And her best friend, who in the end says, you are only a German intellectual and you are not against a Jewish. So, so we put in other positions. But since it's a film about her, it seems as if we are only on her side. Uh, and we are. We have to be when you make a film. And I did a film about Rosa Luxemburg. I was with Rosa Luxemburg. And I, 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 I had her position to, to make understand her position. Uh, I'm not a historian. There's a historian. He, perhaps he will say to me, you are all wrong. But uh, because, no, there, there came out also other positions or other opinions now. Uh, nowadays, and in Germany, I was criticized a lot because I didn't put in all these new uh, 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 news about Eichmann and her and so on. And I said, no, the film is about six, the 60s and the 64, and it's about her and I'm going with her. Yeah, That is my right as a filmmaker. As a historian, I... Uh, I would have been perhaps uh, criticized in the right way, but as a, as a filmmaker, I, 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 I have the right, no? And, and but just to add to that, I, I think for your, your point is well taken, and it was a point that has been made by certain also American critics of the film. And I have to say, from my perspective as the, as the co-author, um, 
for, uh, as Marguerite said, you don't make a film about somebody if you don't respect them and their point of view, and you don't make a film so centered on a single person if you're not trying to take also their emotional point of view. However, when we wrote that scene between her and Hans Jonas, I personally am equally on Hans Jonas' side. I agree with him at the same time as I disagree with him. But I felt that his points were valid. And he, for example, was a quite a well-known and respected philosopher. And he took a very Jewish philosophical point of view of her work. He cons did consider her to be ignorant of, of Jewish history. And whether or not he is right or wrong is another issue. But his impressions of her being a resh haberish uh, German, considering herself to be a German intellectual looking down on Jews, I don't think that was true, but I understood why he thought that. So when that scene was written, I'm as much on his side as I am on hers. And I think it's equally important to talk about the relationship with Kurt Blumenfeld, who was an absolutely committed Zionist. And that scene of their relationship is very much based on the facts. He was a very brilliant uh, man who had a very interesting ideas, and he explains to her why this needs to be a show trial in the film. I think his point of view is extremely well represented, and I agree with him as well. But I should further point out that their dialogue on his deathbed there, that's dialogue taken from a correspondence between her and Gershom Scholem, also a respected uh, philosophical man. So. When I hear we didn't let the other side speak as well as her, or that it wasn't as sort of intellectually verifiable as her side, that always surprises me. Hans Jonas, Kurt Blumenfeld, Gershom Scholem, I feel their sides are very well represented. So for my part, I always find it surprising when I hear that criticism. Well, their sides are represented, but not in a philosophical way, meaning their, their emotional sides are represented, and she's being represented as a very philosophical that gets separated, so it becomes, here's Hannah Arendt, who's thinking very philosophically, and then all the, you know, much more Zionistic or much more emotionally enraged philosophers who aren't using their philosophical brains, they're using their emotional brains. Interesting. It wasn't the way I thought of it. Did you hear the question? No. She was no. saying they're not thinking philosophically, they're thinking emotionally, and therefore they're less credible. Yeah, but all the controversy was very uh, emotional. Uh, when you read what what was written uh, against her, that was much more emotional than philosophical. So uh, no way, because she 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 put out the the point of Hans Jonas in the end that he was uh, objecting her so much, and his mother was was murdered in Auschwitz. So he had in fact much more reason to be so much against her. Uh, and and, uh, and and I understand him like she does, but, uh, but uh, she yeah. said we have to judge or to speak about it not so much emotional. She was the one to put back her emotions. She had them yeah. very much, but as a philosopher and as a reporter, she said I have not the right to put myself and my own emotions in. Uh, and it was very interesting for us that men put their emotions in where normally women are expected to put their emotions in, and she didn't. Uh, and she was very much blamed for it. And, and I, for instance, the, the, uh, the scene with Heidegger in his office, we did in, a, in the uh, bureau at the office of the dean of Luxembourg, uh, where we sh were shooting uh, many scenes be because he got money from Luxembourg. Uh, and he was the dean of an American uh, university, Miami University it was called, I don't know why in Luxembourg, but uh, so, um, and he saw the film and he wrote me a letter after and he liked very much the film and then he said, but because she was blamed so much was also because she was a woman, because of a woman you expect that she's emotional, that she is uh, humble, that she is uh, caring, that she is no, and and that they, she was blamed all, always to be arrogant and without feelings, and and he said never he heard it of a male colleague that he was attacked in this way. 
That is because she was a woman. And in that time, women were, now we, you are all women here, or more, uh, excuse me, <laughs> more or less, let's say. You are, you are much more uh, considered uh, as thinking and, and, and persons, and not only as an aspect of, you know, what, what is uh, a wage, what is expected from, from a woman behavior. So she was in this way very exceptional. And the, the, uh, for me, the, the, the half of the part of the controversy was also that, hmm. that the woman dared to be not, you know, humble and so, and so on. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, and take one in the back. Why, why did we choose to end? We said we started to give more emotional information about her towards the end of the film, where she talks about her father. And why did we choose to end the film at that point? <laughs> <laughs> why we started at six in the uh, in the moment where Eichmann is kidnapped. So you have to to choose the start and the ending. And if you want to know more, then go on and read a very good biography of Elisabeth Jan Brühl and uh, there are so many to, to, of herself too. But in the film, I think we said it, the controversy went on for years after. Uh, and, and, and in our first title was a controversy. Then uh, our producer said, no, it's better to, to, to give her the name and, and so on. And it was right, Hannah Arendt, it's, it's a better title than the controversy. But uh, since it was our, our uh, first theme, the controversy, we, we decided to, to, to cut up after two years of the controversy. And, and, and then in the end, you can, can read that uh, the, uh, about the, you know, the evil, the reflection of evil went on with her until her her end and her death. But uh, what do you want to know about this uh, afterwards? She stood with her husband, she was still very criticized, she was going on writing and reflecting and more and more she became in the end of her writings more and more again a philosopher. If I can point something in the film, they say, they repeat a couple of times, why are you fixing up in these 10 pages of my 300 page manuscript? And now that we look 50 years later, you can ask yourself, when somebody measures to you Hannah Arendt, what comes to the mind of anyone? Doesn't come. This was the person who said that the Judith Frat, they say, oh, Hannah Arendt, the woman who introduced the concept of the banality of evil, and that's what is transcendent about her. Of course, that was not the controversy in 1963, but it is what came 50 years later, and that should be illuminating to us in some sense, which in the film, they are not the people. Uh, yes, Will. I will hear a man for a change. <laughs> uh, I think it was a spectacular Portrait of a marriage, among other things. Uh, Absolutely. Two, no. Absolutely. It was it was two two thinkers and so multidimensional and so well rounded. And my question is about flatness. Um, I think Eichmann, on the in the images, the documentary images and so forth, really does come across as a rather flat, uh, banal, sort of rigid, limited uh, human being. 
And the other people that come up across to me in the movie as the very flattest uh, sort of caricature human beings are the fellow professors who turn against her having been so complimentary when she's famous and so on. And I wondered uh, if you talk about that flatness, and I sort of suspected that maybe you were a little bit going for an analogy with Eichmann. I mean, not that they're guilty of the same crimes by any means, but, but that they're very, very limited, flat, uh, just uh, unthinking, uh, knee-jerk types of individuals. But they don't fully or follow orders. Nobody gave them the order to be against an Arab. So that's a big difference that Eichmann follow ordered and he has not the, the possibility to think on his own. In, instead, the other one would have had the possibility to think on, her, on their own. And they, perhaps they didn't. Because but in a they, way, there was a kind of a psychiatrist or a group thing. Yeah, a group was thing. Tremendous pressure yes, but that was a group thing. That was something <laughs> else. There was nobody like the Führer right. who gave orders, and you have to think like that, and you have to give up your own possibility to think to somebody else. They had their own possibility to think, and they thought in the way they, they are presented. And, and, and there, there was, we, we read all the, the, the uh, uh, articles written against her, and they were sometimes they were much more cruel than what we showed. No. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's interesting what you're saying, but I, I think there's two points here. One is that the professor that we showed, what was important to us was to a, again, when you're creating a film which has such enormous intellectual ambition. Let's explain what Hannah Arendt meant when she was talking about the banality of evil. Well, that was pretty complicated for the you know, for a film, but on the other side you're trying to show Hannah Arendt's emotional journey through the experience of being exiled for the third time. So having been kicked out of Germany, imprisoned in France, and then suddenly what one can only say is was intellectually and occasionally emotionally ostracized in America. So you're comparing in a way types of exile. Right? I mean, one was being kicked out of a country where you would have been killed, most likely. Another is escaping from a prison, you know, a prison camp. And the other is intellectual and emotional exile, which was the American version, right? I mean, it, we're talking about the post-McCarthy time. Um, so the flatness, I think, partly comes from that. It's not life-threatening. Nobody's giving them orders, but they're still responding to a mob mentality. So it, it's, it's, it's flatter as you sort of say, because it's not life-threatening in the same way, but it's more irritating because it's enforced. Um, but the secondary thing that I think that you're reacting to, which, which is interesting to me, is that the professor was an amalgam, of course, of the general academic response. And, and as Margarita says, it's a mild version of the kinds of things people said and did to her. Um, the other characters were based on, on singular real characters because what was important to us is that the people who were for and against her were directly involved in her lives because otherwise it's not dramatic and we can't relate to it and we don't experience it in the way that you want to experience what is really a fictional film. So as an amalgam he might read differently but that was correct because the American exile was, was also so much different from the other kinds of exile that she experienced. Does that yeah. <laughs> but we never, you are, you uh, in a way uh, uh, said that we put Eichmann and, and the uh, American intellectuals being against her on the same level of flatness. And that was really not our point. No. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Was it, sorry, was it choice of yours to put uh, Eichmann actually? Absolutely. Really, uh, absolutely. as opposed, yeah. and the judges appearing. Absolutely. No, because I said without these real uh, Eichmann documents, you couldn't understand her, and you couldn't follow her in her observing him. Because uh, I was always asked why you didn't get a, a good actor for to doing that, no? Because we are in a fiction film, why you, 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 you put in the real stuff? And, and I always said, when, they, when you get a good actor, uh, everybody sees his brilliance. Oh, 
he is so great, look how he is he's doing it. So you're in admiration in front of the actor and you don't see the mediocrity of the person. And you can't follow her in her thinking and observation of this character. So for me it was from the beginning and we saw together the specialist that's an Israeli film, a documentary film only about the child and only about this Eichmann and he followed in, in a certain way also Hannah Arendt uh, of, as he says, says it in the beginning of the film. So um, that was shown and, and uh, there were two things for me from the beginning uh, what was absolutely certain I had to make that was the Eichmann real trial to put in to make people feel what Hannah Arendt felt. I wanted that people could observe him exactly how she could observe him and come up with the same solution, perhaps. For instance, for me, uh, the, the most important moment to describe him as a non-thinking person, uh, and even if he did now, there's historians who say he was much more clever than he he made believe in the and and at, at, at the day. and he made up as an actor his appearance to be more uh, weak and more not so intelligent and following only rules and in fact he was not. But there's one moment when he, when the judge is asking him uh, if there would have been more civil courage, uh, would you, would it be uh, uh, different? And he said, but yes, when the civil courage would be uh, hierarchically. Uh, hierarchically organized. Yeah. <laughs> to put together civil courage with hierarchy thinking. That for me is a moment where he really you could understand that he couldn't think. No? That he was not really intelligent. So that was one point and the other point was that I had needed Barbara Sukova. Without her I wouldn't have done the film. And I think you are d'accord, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, when I'm saying something in French, I immediately... Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm living in France, so uh, for me, fr uh, French is much easier than to speak in English. But uh, so without her, I couldn't have done the film. And so many people in Germany, it was like a controversy, were against this fact and against my wish to make the film with her. And, and she did also Rosa Luxemburg with me. So I knew what she's able to do and what she, I could watch her thinking. And that was for me the point. I and needed, a, I field, needed right? a, an actress who could really see her thinking. Okay. And just just to add to that, I mean, there's two ways. On the point of the young woman over here who, who said, I think you know, you are not very visible. I'm not visible this. here. Yeah, this is true. the director. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you are thinking you of the shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, along the lines of, uh, did we present the other side? I mean, imagine using an act not only as Margarita says, would you have a situation in in which the, per the great performance would distract from the the question of who was this man and what is his character? But the criticisms that exist to this day and are ongoing are was she wrong, was he acting, was he putting on an act to what, to what effect, I have no idea. Had a director who, as you say, went with the vision of Hannah Arendt, directed Eichmann to behave in a certain way, you also open yourself up to the accusation that you made Eichmann, if Eichmann had been acted as he was, it would be considered an acting job directed by the director to make him look stupid. So it becomes incredibly circular, but when you have the real man, we can all look at him on our own and judge her judgment of him in an open way. And, and something Barbara Sukova told me recently that, I, that you clearly knew, but I didn't, she did a tremendous amount of research. She read a lot of Hannah Arendt, she read a lot about Hannah Arendt. She had a philosophy tutor, she had a pool tutor because she didn't know how to play pool and Hannah Arendt did. But she didn't look at the footage of Eichmann, which I didn't know because she, one, mm -hmm. one thing Hannah Arendt always says is she was surprised. When she went to the trial and, and saw the first one in the flesh, as she put it, she was shocked by finding somebody that she considered to be a kind of clown, and that became the enigma that she explored. And Barbara felt that she too wanted to be surprised when she first saw the men, and she wanted that moment to happen on camera. 
and and I think that's something that she also achieved very well the the shock and despair and curiosity that that inspired in her um, I think was really real within Barbara Sukova as well David I will give you probably the last question because I know the buses are leaving soon so some of you have to leave but go ahead there are dozens and dozens of books written on Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt um, both reacting to her and analyzing her arguments uh, in an emotional, and philosophical, and intellectual level. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about why you decided to approach this in the medium of film, uh, and what advantages there are to putting this on as a movie, as opposed to, I guess, writing a play or, or a book. Oh, thank you. I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> I have no other choice. <laughs> Being interested in her, I had to make a movie. Perhaps <laughs> she, as a writer, could have wrote also. Hey. Well, maybe to turn the question around, you could ask what are the advantages of making a film about this rather than writing another book? Maybe is a, is a way to think about the question, perhaps. And I think that. Um, a guiding quote for both of us was something that Mary McCarthy wrote about her um, when she wrote um, in the New York Review of Books, she wrote something for Hannah Arendt after she died. They were indeed very close friends and she said that when you watched Hannah Arendt teach, you saw the motions of the mind made visible in gesture and action. And when I read that, when we read that, we thought, well, okay, that... How hard can that be <laughs> if we can just do that? And I think bringing ideas alive on f in the context of a dramatic film as opposed to a documentary um, is something rare and difficult. Um, but when you can do it and when you can kind of line up, if that's the proper phrase, somebody's intellectual engagement with their emotional place in the world, that's something film can do best of all. You know, you can do one or the other in a way it, on paper, but in a film when you can bring ideas alive in the heart of a person, that's film. Yeah, that's film, but it's not the best way to do it. We are, we are not, uh, you know, she, she says it's the best way in a way. There are so many possibilities. Do it on yourself. Write a book. Huh? You have all the possibilities. Everybody of you can do it in your in your own way. It's only our way we did it like that. So and, we and give her yet? a sort of uh, yeah. The first step you can go on then with other steps. Which is exactly what Hannah Arendt would have said, actually. She would say, actually, Jonathan Schell, who's kind of a character in the film, said, said to her that she should talk about nuclear arms and the nuclear arms race. And she said, I am old. You're young. She said, why don't you do it? <laughs> you see, that's my position. You are very young. Please go on. Huh? OK. So well, maybe poetry. Yeah. On that note, let's thank the wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you get you got a lot from it as I got.